So today, I just want to um, talk about the chapter, and then I want to make sure we got all the groups organized. I'm going to call this week's group accomplishments also extra credit because we still isn't clear by the end of today, everybody needs to be in a group, and you will have to have your task done next week. If you're not in a group, um, we have to resolve that after the lecture today. Um, Dylan said he would come at about 7. He's going to make a group of people setting up servers and racks, which is something. Um, and there are the two groups that are just studying problems to prepare for the exam. And if there's nothing else happening, uh, anyway, we'll, we'll deal with that later. Anyway, any questions about anything? All right, let's, yeah. Did you, get a, did you get any luck getting Chelsea Manning to speak here? No, didn't even answer. Uh, but now she's running for he running for Congress or something. Oh, so, that's right, yeah. So, uh, and she's been New York based, which I didn't realize. So I guess Chelsea yeah. Manning's got things happening down there that preclude coming here and talking to us for free. Um, so you know that's the case. I couldn't get uh, Dan Kaminsky. I couldn't get uh, Kevin Mitnick. You know, there's I couldn't get the guy that wrote uh, Nmap. There's a bunch of people that are you know got better things to do than talk to a small class for free. But you get some speakers. But you know you can't get the celebs. I did get the Jeffrey Carr though, the guy that wrote the. Uh, Shoot, they shoot some spooks. So you got occasionally you get celebrities, but you know, the A-listers are they only talk for money and stuff. Um, so anyway, that's that's the way it is. Some people are too important for us. So uh, legal and regulatory issues. They are the major legal systems in the world. Civil law is where you're arguing about money. People do not generally go to prison. This is lawsuits where you say uh, my landlord didn't fix the refrigerator, so I demand that he pay me back my rent for five months. You have some finite amount of money you're asking for, and it's all resolved if people just cough up the money. So, um, all right. Then there's common law, which came from the UK and is used here. And this is the major legal system that applies in the CISSP exam. And this is where precedent matters. That's why you always talk about uh, a case like Weave, where Weave did a hack and found a bunch of AT&T numbers, but the hack he did was really nothing different than just typing a bunch of URLs up in the URL bar, so uh, technically it was very weak. And the question is, is that really uh, a crime? Is that really hacking? Is that really actionable? And uh, when people finally resolve it, you like to say that sets some kind of precedent about whether this or that is legal. Um, of course, that is pretty rough because every case depends on its own details. And assuming that another case where someone did something similar will be determined the same way, is a stretch, and that's why there's always an argument over whether the precedent really applies in this case or not. But anyway, then of course there's religious law. The main one you hear about is Islamic religious law, Sharia, and then there's customary law in other countries um, related to best practices where you just do what is expected of you. In America, the two main categories of law we have here are criminal and civil law. Criminal law is the law that sends people to prison, and it is the law that is uh, uh, punished by the police even if there is no victim complaining. If you kill somebody and they're not around to complain, the cops will still hunt you down and lock you up. That's a crime. They take it so seriously that they are willing to take action even when no one is complaining. And civil law is the when someone has an injury and they are demanding satisfaction in the form of money. And that is where you have to have someone complaining. That's why one big problem is a lot of people like to complain that uh, someone's polluting the water. But you can't sue because somebody else is polluting the water. You can only sue if you are the victim. If you drank that water and got a disease or something, then you can try suing. That's called standing. You have to prove that you personally were injured by this or you can't complain. You can't just go say these other people are doing a bad thing. So that's the game here. And this, so in civil, in criminal law, you have to have proof beyond a reasonable doubt is a, the most strong requirement of proof because somebody really goes to jail for this. But in civil law, you just have to have the preponderance of the evidence. Sometimes people say 51%. It has to be more likely than not that it happened, and then you win and they have to pay you money because that's not considered such a serious thing as sending people to prison. The simplest kind is compensatory damages, where if you cost somebody money by wrecking their car and they had to pay to fix it, the compensatory damage is you give them the money they had to pay to fix their car. And then there's statutory damage, which is just to punish you for breaking the letter of the law, even if it didn't do any actual financial harm. <clears throat> and then there's punitive damage, which is just extra amount added to punish you so you knock it off and don't do it again. So those are the types of financial damages. Um, another type of law is administrative law. Um, this is things like uh, income tax and HIPAA and such, where there is a law saying you must do certain things. And then there is a punishment for not doing those things. You didn't shred your records and so on. I heard a guy on NPR talk about this. He was... Um, 
a farmer and he didn't like genetically modified corn going in his field and he his neighbor grew genetically modified corn and the corn blew over and grew in his field so his corn was not pure anymore and he said i wanted to sue but you can't do it because you can't prove that this plant came from that corn and came from that field uh, so what you do you'll never win because you cannot prove exactly how this thing got here what you do is you get a regulation passed that there must be like 100 yards between fields and then you can punish them for not obeying the regulation that's how you deal with things like that where you cannot prove cause and effect is yeah roundup uh um, roundup is a related issue yeah roundup goes with it you use roundup and then you grow genetically modified corn that doesn't get killed by the roundup that's how you make really much higher yields from your corn they have the same scenario it is that's what it is that's what the gm corn is it's corn grown to be Roundup resistant. Or the guy, <coughs> they were sued, they sued him because he had grown on his earth and it just blew by the wind. Yes, that can, that can happen too. That's okay. another issue, yeah. I wanted to ask, so was, is that adjudicated by ALJ? ALJ? A law judge? I, besides on these? I these think two. it's just a normal court, but I don't really know. Okay. Yeah. It's a good question. Anyway, so FCC regulations for communication, HIPAA, um, and other regulations like FAA, there's a, uh, an agency that just passed rules and then you have to obey the rules or there is some kind of punishment. So uh, due care we've talked about, this is the prudent man rule, you should do what a reasonable person would do. Um, so when Facebook left their entire database accessible online, unencrypted, and the master password was happiness, they were accused of negligence, saying that is not reasonable. And so uh, that's the game here. Due diligence is the management to make sure that people are in fact practicing due care. You need evidence. If you want to prove anything in court, real evidence is the main evidence where you have some real thing. This is the murder weapon. This is the hard drive that was used. Uh, direct evidence is witness testimony. For better or worse, the gold standard of evidence is considered witness testimony. There are enormously good psychological studies showing that witnesses will be completely wrong about what they see, but it remains our gold standard of testimony. If someone says, I saw that person, they did it, it's just weighted very highly. Circumstantial evidence is indirect evidence, um, like footprints or something that don't really prove it, but do lend support to the belief that something bad happened. And there's corroborative evidence that supports things. And hearsay, where you have the testimony of someone who did not see the crime, but they heard somebody else talk about the crime. This is generally inadmissible, but there are some exceptions because all computer records are technically hearsay. It appears in a log file. The computer is not a human that can be sworn in and testify. So the fact that I saw it in a log file is really what someone else saw, but uh, automatically generated digital evidence is generally accepted now as uh, acceptable evidence. So best evidence is the original documents. Um, secondary evidence is copies of documents. And then you have the issue of evidence integrity. Uh, if people have a chance to modify the evidence, it becomes of little or no value in court. So you have to say it was locked up. You have to have a chain of custody form saying someone took responsibility to make sure it was locked up and nobody was allowed to meddle with it and then until it was brought to court. So you'll have a piece of paper here and the chain of custody is really the people. This person has signed saying, I took the gun, I put it in a box, I took it to the evidence room and locked it up. So between this time and that time, I made sure nobody messed with it. And that person can go to court and swear, I made sure nobody messed with it. And if you don't have an unbroken chain of custody, then the evidence is of less value because the defense lawyer will say somebody could have tampered with it during that interval when nobody is around to swear they were watching over it or making sure it was locked up somewhere safe. Searches are an issue for federal agents. <clears throat> if the government wants to search you, then the Fourth, protection, Fourth Amendment protects you. If your boss wants to search your work computer, the Federal Fourth Amendment does not protect you because the boss is not the government. And all the Fourth Amendment said is the government cannot be searching through your stuff without probable cause. They have to go get a search warrant first, unless there are um, exceptions like exigent circumstances, like they think somebody is being killed right now, that's an emergency, then they're allowed to violate this. Uh, also, objects in plain sight, and at a public checkpoint, these are um, exceptions to the probable cause rule. And private citizens, however, like your boss, are not part of the government, so the Fourth Amendment does not protect you from them. And if private citizens, this is something that used to happen, um, your company would call the cops and say somebody's hacking me, and they would say, well, why don't you do this to find out what's happening and tell me what you find out. And if your, your administrator does something to help law enforcement, they are now an agent of law enforcement, 
and now they're held by the Fourth Amendment. So this became an issue. Um, if you decide to help the law, you may very well mess up your, uh, the legal rights of what you're doing. Of course, in most cases, this is why most companies, there's a fundamental decision made whenever you investigate company crimes on company property, whether you ever want to go to court or not. And most companies say, we don't care about going to court, we don't want to sue anybody, all I want to know is what happened, and if something bad happened, I'll just fire people or something. I don't need to go to court to punish people. Um, so we do not need to make the standards of evidence that would hold up in court, which is expensive and complicated. So this is a big issue. If you do find something illegal happening at your company, if it's something horrible like kidnapping or murder, then you really have to call the cops. But usually it's something like theft of company property or misuse of company property, and you are not required to prosecute that. You can not press charges and just deal with it yourself, and that's what most people prefer to do. So you make your decision whether to avoid law in involve law enforcement. You often don't want to because once you call in law enforcement, you can't get rid of them. You can't say, oh, no, we changed our mind. Go away. Stop investigating. And you can't stop it from going to the press very much. So very likely it's going to do harm to your company and you'd rather not deal with all that. You'd rather just quietly figure out who did the bad thing and fire them. Anyway, um, entrapment is persuading somebody to do a crime they would not have done otherwise. I'm amazed how little use this is against hacking convictions. <coughs> I mean, Sabu it was the leader of LulzSec. He created AntiSec from LulzSec, which came from Anonymous in 2012, because the FBI arrested him, and they said, we're going to lock you up unless you act as an agent, unless you do what we tell you. So they installed software on his machine and got FBI agents to take over his machine and told him what to say. And he went back and created a new hacking group called AntiSec just to commit outrageous crimes against law enforcement so they would all go to jail. Then he talked everybody into doing it, and they all went to jail. And I said, it seemed to me like entrapment, but they did not win. Anyway, um. Enticement is similar, where they law enforcement provides conditions. I heard about this. There was a terrorist plot that the FBI said they had thwarted in Portland, and it turned out that they found some guy hanging around online in a jihadi forum. They sent someone to make friends with him. Then this guy said, hey, I could get you a gun. I could get you a bomb. And that guy gave him a fake gun and bomb, and then got him to go try to blow something up. And then they arrested him. Like, wait a minute. It's not clear there would have been any crime here at all if you hadn't talked him into it. But anyway. Um, so your computer can be the target of crime when you're attacking the system itself. It can be used as a tool to steal data or hurt people. And then you have the problem of attribution. Once a computer crime has happened, it is very difficult to figure out who really committed the crime. That's why somebody, uh, it was Sony, right? Somebody hacked Sony, and for a long time, everybody thought it was different people, and the government said it was North Korea, but they didn't provide any evidence of that. And for a long time, everyone was very suspicious that it really wasn't North Korea. Now I think it's, well, further evidence has come out and made it pretty clear that it was. But it is the problem of attribution. How do you really know who did a bad thing over the Internet? Anyway, intellectual property has a lot of defenses in the United States, none in China. Anyway, so trademarks are a logo used for marketing. Patents are where you have the right to use an invention and nobody else can use it for a period of time. And the same thing with copyrights. American copyright law is extremely ruthless and goes on, I think it's really the life of the author plus 50 years or something, so an awful lot of things are restricted. And there's an awful lot, as you know, the number two most common crime in America is copyright infringement, co downloading illegal stuff off BitTorrent. 50 million people do it, last I heard. How about corporate copyright? Uh, there's no particular difference between corporate copyright and personal copyright, I think. I think a company owns it. <coughs> the company may have trademarks and patents, but Cook and people, as far as I know, there's no difference whether it's a corporation or a person. But I might be wrong about that. Anyway, then there's licenses. These end user license agreement. If you use software, you aren't allowed to just do anything you want. For example, you're not allowed to like put it in a box and sell it and put your name on it and keep the money. So there's limits to what you can do. And then there's trade secrets, and these are protected by non-disclosure agreements that apply everywhere and non-compete agreements, which are not valid in California, which is one of the main factors attributed that, to uh, Silicon Valley's extraordinary productivity. If you are, example, Cisco engineers, and you don't like what your management is doing, you can just walk out the door and form a competing company called Juniper that does the same thing, only better, and it's perfectly legal in California, but in any other state it wouldn't be. They wouldn't hire you unless you signed a non-compete agreement saying you cannot work in this field for five years if you leave, so you're trapped or you have to switch into music or something when you leave. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, so software piracy, of course, is the main one. People have illegal copies of things without paying the fee, um, making copies of things, stealing source code and other confidential property from other companies with espionage, and tricking people. 
into sending emails to you or other documents with typo squatting is a popular one. You make a name that's off by a uh, misspelling and you will get tons of company email from people who made that misspelling in their address book. And you are not allowed to have that, but it's very easy to get. And uh, it's one of the many techniques to steal things that are sent off on the internet. Yeah. Can you say something about the very last thing, the cyber squatting and the typo squatting? What is that? That's where you um, buy a domain name close to a company's domain. Okay. You can get things that are sent to you. Uh, you can also buy like yahoo.net and the real company's yahoo.com. You buy something which then attracts web page visitors and email and other things to come to you that are not yours. So is it legal? Uh, I would say buying the domain name is not illegal, but getting stuff that doesn't belong to you and using it would be illegal. And doing something in the middle would be a matter for your lawyer to argue about. Like if you read it and then decided it wasn't really yours and you didn't actually sell it or hire anybody, then you'd try to defend yourself. I've seen it. Uh, I went to a conference and they did this. They bought, um, they got terabytes of email from major companies. It's, it's obviously quite common that people have misspellings in their email addresses. Anyway, so uh, Europe has very strong privacy laws. We do not have them in America. The constitutional right of privacy is extremely unclear in America. In Europe, it is very strong. That's why um, a lot of American businesses are now having to modify their practices because the laws in Europe, like Google and other search engines, are going to have to have the right to be forgotten. You can make a request and say, erase everything you have about me. I want a clean slate. And you have no such right in America, but you have this right in Europe. And many American people, privacy advocates, hope that after they retool their system to do what they said would be so expensive in Europe, it won't be too hard to persuade them to do it here, too, since they've already got the system. But anyway, um, their safe harbor is one of the extremely difficult issues. Um, so if you are a European company, you would like to use Google and Amazon and Yahoo and Gmail and all these great free American services and there is no European company that can offer you that kind of service for free, but um, foreigners have no privacy rights whatever in America. The government can just totally read your mail, copy it, tap your phone calls and everything else. There's no vestige of any, in, in, any motivation here to limit that. So it is illegal, according to European privacy laws, for them to use any American companies because they have no protection over here. So to make this possible, they passed a safe harbor law where American companies would agree to do something to protect the privacy of European visitors. And um, then it would be OK for European companies to use American services. But then Snowden leaked out all the facts, which proved that the NSA had been totally stealing the data from all those companies. And then it was in the US government's hands, and they couldn't care less about anybody's privacy as long as they're not an American citizen. So that ended Safe Harbor. They tore it down saying, it is even though Yahoo says they're protecting our data, it is now abundantly clear that Yahoo cannot protect our data from the US government, and they are not protecting our privacy from the US government. So there was a big argument here, and the replacement in 2017 was Safe Harbor. This is the latest attempt to do the same thing. Um, this is. Uh, a legal fiction, essentially, permitting European companies to pretend their data is safe over here when it almost certainly is not. But the point is they have a strong economic incentive not to try to duplicate all the American services in Europe, so they allow this. Uh, sometimes it helps us. When the United States government made the clipper chip and they standardized the entire American financial system on 56-bit encryption, we continued to use it when anybody could hack in, and the only reason they ever changed it was because European banks said they were not going to do business with American banks anymore if we kept encrypting our stuff with this horrible encryption that anybody could crack. That was what finally persuaded them to upgrade our encryption. So, you know, we can only go so far before the pressure of the world affects us. Was yeah. that, no, the Clipper chip was directly had was, to do with encryption? It was DES, yeah. It was the chip they sold to perform DES encryption, which was the standard encryption pushed out to financial markets and recommended everywhere that was easy to break. And it was used to keep it on, ostensibly for keeping children safe, but it, it's nuked on everybody, right? Uh, that was the, the V-chip, not to keep children oh, safe. That was the V-chip, which was another issue. Oh, okay. yeah. Anyway, similar kind of government issue, though. Anyway, so uh, there's a council on cybercrime with the United States is in, so if you have a criminal across national boundaries, you can, to some extent, prosecute them in another country and get information from another country. But of course, it's expensive and it will only happen if you've done really a lot of harm. Um, let me see 
how far it's going to be. I'm trying to make sure we've got my, ah, oh, cahoots are coming up. Good. I was afraid I might have the deck that didn't have my cahoots in it. All right. So the uh, United States also exported, uh, restricted the export of cryptography in the 1990s on the grounds that if we ship something like RSA encryption to a foreign country, they can use it to talk about things and our government can't read it and they could be terrorists. So it was illegal to export Pentium 4 processors and encryption and they had special weak encryption for export versions. Microsoft Windows XP had a special N version for foreign countries to use that used 40-bit encryption, which was totally breakable because it was illegal to export anything with high degree of encryption. And this has finally ended. But for a long time, it was technically a violation of arms control to take a strong cryptographic product and put it on like GitHub, where somebody in another country might download it. Yeah. So the previous slide about the cooperation for yeah. extradition, yeah. The, one of your most recent news articles was about the EU <coughs> going to extradite a hacker to the United States. Lori Love. Because the Lori Love and also the, uh, the NSA hacker. Yes, this is common. And so there is some limit to this cooperation. But the um, yeah, right now... The, the private prisons were, were yes. too... Yes, uh, Julian Assange. Also, many people in Europe have protested that if they come to America, they will have inhumane conditions in prison with rather good evidence for this because they said this guy's a suicide risk. And they said, well, in America, we'll put him in restraints, remove everything he could strangle himself with, and put him in solitary confinement to prevent suicide. And they say, that will just make him more depressed and more likely to commit suicide, which I think anybody could tell you. I mean, they, they, that's their argument, is that our conditions over here are inhumane and violate their rights. So. They often do fail to extradite people. So this doesn't mean they're going to extradite, but it means there's some degree of cooperation. Yeah, it's not, it's not, as, it's not what the US government would like, which is they extradite people here. Um, anyway, so I got some cahoots about that stuff. And all these are, of course, exciting issues that, with many details. So 125. Uh, and I think I found I have to put something about the name of this. This is uh, risk management. I think risk will do it. I have so many cahoots, it's hard to find them now. Risk, <coughs> there. So, when do you need proof beyond a reasonable doubt? All right, that's criminal law. All right. So what punishment happens just because you broke the law, even if you didn't do any harm? All right, that's statutory, all right. So what's HIPAA? All right, that's regulatory law. Let me mute these guys. I think they don't know they're broadcasting everything they say. All right. You know, if I was to leave that on and then hear them reciting secrets like their credit card number or something, you'd have an interesting privacy issue. Because they obviously don't know their mic is on. Anyway, so... um. All right, that's regulatory. All right, a copy of a document, what's that? All right, that's secondary, all right. So Equifax, they wanna search a worker's office computer. What do they need first? There you go, they don't need anything. It's company property, the management can examine it at will. None of these protections apply. All right. Yeah. What, which law was changed because of Snowden? He really rocked the boat. Okay, and that's safe harbor? All right. So I'm going to record these winners. Um, laws and regulations. HIPAA is one I mentioned a lot. This, the purpose of this law was primarily health insurance portability. The issue here was, suppose you go to a trip to another town and then you get hit by a truck and then the ambulance driver picks you up off the street. They don't know that you're allergic to penicillin. How are they gonna know? They have no way to get your medical records. They're on a piece of paper in your hometown so people will get the wrong treatment and die. So the idea was to make it easy to get your medical records everywhere by putting them on the internet. People then said that will violate your privacy, so they added privacy to it, so you have to encrypt everything on the internet in very general terms. It says you should protect that information so it isn't just available to everybody, but it is readily available to authorized healthcare workers. That's the idea. Uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act protects company uh, computers that are used by the government or that are used in interstate commerce 
which used to be only a small set of computers when the law was written, but now means everything on the internet. So that led to the unfortunate overreach of this law, which makes it illegal to do anything beyond your authorization on any computer and on the internet. Authorization, which doesn't even have to be written down, it is the owner's perceived terms of service. So if I go to somebody's shoe shopping site and I type an apostrophe in the URL, if they feel like that does not represent a sincere attempt to buy shoes, I have broken the law. And that's the game. So this is why this is a very generic law. It's the one under which most hackers end up being prosecuted. And many security researchers, if you do anything fishy on the internet, people frequently say you have broken the CFAA. The Electronic Communications Privacy Act was to stop um, wiretapping. This was weakened quite a lot by the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act was our response to the 9-11 terrorism, where the government got greatly enhanced powers to spy on everything. And uh, those were never rescinded, and I think just recently renewed yet again. Um, America continues to have a very terrified, paranoid posture that terrorists are going to kill us if we don't let the government read everything. And that's pretty much where we still are. Graham Leach Bailey Act was a response to Enron. And I think this, oh, that was a star box. GLB lets you um, protect customer, forces you to protect customer information. Sarbox is an attempt to limit um, how much you lie about your finances. So when you trick people into investing in you, you can't hopefully conceal the fact that you're in god awful debt and you're about to get sued and stuff. Um, this seems to me like one of the many things that all the Bitcoin companies are probably going to fall under. They fall under an awful lot of these things. They pretty much don't have any financial disclosure. And like I say, the entire Bitcoin bubble was pumped by this fake. Thing from Bitfinex that pretends to be worth a dollar and pretends to be backed by a dollar, but it totally is not. And if they ever get to court, I think this will be one of the many laws they'll be found to have broken. PCI is not a law. PCI is industry self-regulation. This is what happens in America. Com often industries do not want to be regulated by the government, so they invent industry self-regulation in the hopes that that will satisfy people and the government will not come down and irritate them by passing laws and making them file forms with the feds. So this is uh, Visa and MasterCard and other major um, credit card vendors have agreed on certain rules. You have to be audited by an official licensed auditor once a year and you have to have penetration tests and so on. Um, and as you can see, it is questionably effective. Every breach you ever heard of, these people are PCI compliant. If they weren't PCI compliant, they would not have any credit card numbers to steal. So it certainly is true that PCI compliance has not stopped people from stealing credit card numbers in large measure. And now you have to say, would the government do any better? And it's not clear. But the government doesn't seem to be motivated to step in yet. So if you get breached, you are supposed to notify people. Um, there are 47 states require it. There's no federal law, which means it is very burdensome to the companies. If you have a database, you have to obey all those state laws. That's why there's been a lot of people trying to pass one federal breach law, so all these would be superseded. But that has not happened, and uh, this is where we are now. It is undoubtedly true that an enormous number of companies get breached and do not disclose it because they don't know. And then there are interesting edge cases like Uber that got breached and then decided afterwards to call it a bug bounty and pay the criminals to shut up and then say, well, then we weren't breached and didn't tell anybody. And now they're in court arguing, was that a breach or was that not a breach? And well, it's really not clear. If you trust third parties, um, this is something that uh, has come up frequently. So if you have somebody else you hire to do part of your business, which everybody does, then you have service level agreements is a good idea. Now they promise a certain level of service and there are certain punishments if they don't. If you hire a contractor to fix your roof and they instead burn down the house, you would like to think that you could get some money out of them and hopefully you have an agreement to specify that. So the, um, you can have attestation from a third party saying that these people meet a certain standard and this is what large companies usually do and there are certain standards SAS 70, ISO 27001, PCI, DSS you can have a third party say you can trust these guys because I have checked them and they meet the standards that's what Bitfinex says about their tether coin they say we paid for third parties to audit us and they will tell you that we really do have a dollar for all of the two billion tether coins we put out there but their auditor quit and refused to do the audit, and the banks refused to give them service, so they claim to have been audited, but they cannot actually produce any of those audit documents. But if they could, that would be some reason to believe what they claim about their financial standing. So pen tests, um, you may have the right to penetration test the company you're doing business with to see if they're secure, um, <coughs> and it is in general a good idea to consider the security of products before you buy them.
and to consider the trustworthiness of the companies before you trust them. Uh, so that's vendor governance, making sure that your vendor actually does good enough work. If you acquire companies, you are inheriting all their problems and liabilities, so you should be aware of that. And if you split a company, then you may have uh, other problems coming out of that. Um, all right, and then there's the issue of ethics. The ISC squared has a special code of ethics. If you became a CISSP, you are required to obey these four general canons, protect society and the commonwealth, act honorably, justly, and legally, provide competent service, just like any other contractor. If someone hires you to do something and you don't know how to do it, don't take their money and do a bad job. Admit what you can do. Don't pretend to do what you can't do. And you have to donate some of your time to advance and protect the profession. Help newcomers get in, give talks at conferences for which you are not paid and things like that. You're expected to donate some of your time to uh, protect the profession and advance it. If you get a CISSP or any ISC squared certification, anybody in the world can make an ethics complaint against you. And I've had one made against me by a guy who is a well-known lunatic in the world of security and decided to take away my certification with a completely false complaint. And once you get a complaint, you must respond within 30 days or you lose your certification. And it doesn't matter, they don't have to have any grounds for it, and they don't have to be in any relationship to you. They don't have to be a client or anything. This is, seemed a little rough to me when it happened, but anyway, I made it a class project to respond to this. Um, and so I was accused of misrepresenting myself as a city college employee. And I said, this is all garbage, it didn't happen. And I got my lawyer to write a letter, and they said, you're right, it didn't happen, forget it, this is stupid. But I did respond within 30 days and they did not take away my certification. And after you get your certification, you are forever in jeopardy of the same thing. Any lunatic in the world can complain about you and you have to respond. Um, all right, this hopefully is why people trust the CISSP because supposedly uh, you would lose it if you were extremely unethical. Um, I'm not aware of any case in which anybody actually lost their CISSP for any good reason. As far as I can tell, the entire use of this activity is to harass honest people and the bad guys seem to skate, but in principle, at some level, it may actually be, do some good. Yeah? Are those all public record? Like, did, does it show if somebody searches for you, kind of like the bar? Uh, as far as I know, they are not. That's a good question. Anyway, um, all right, then there's governance. Um, there are a lot of documentations. You have a policy, which is your overall, we talked about these before, policy is the overarching statement. We will protect the confidentiality in, integrity and availability of the personally identifiable information. Then you have procedures, just what you should do, and standards, which are the particular brands and products you use. Then guidelines, which recommend how to do it, and baselines, which specify certain standards you would try to achieve. Uh, these are your sort of the documents that will go through your company showing your security governance. Uh, then you've got personnel issues. You should be checking the resumes, calling the previous employers to see if your employee is a known thief or other kind of lunatic. You should um, fire people. You have to be very careful. You can't just fire the people you don't like and then keep the people you do like even if they did the same thing. You have to have a fair policy. If you do this bad thing, this punishment will occur. Otherwise, they can sue you for unfair termination. And you have to consider the security of the people you work with. And if you outsource, you can outsource work, but you cannot outsource responsibility. So if you hire an idiot and they lose the data, you are still liable for having lost that data. It's your fault that you hired somebody that was going to lose the data. You were supposed to hire somebody trustworthy and then monitor what they did. Uh, if they do something bad, you are ultimately responsible for having handed your data to some guy that did a bad thing. I got some <coughs> hoots about that. So which law happened because of Enron? Oh, sure. Yeah, it was Sarbanes Oxley. All right. Which of these is not a law? Okay. Payment card industry, data security standard, self regulation. If Microsoft split into two companies, what would that be? This nearly happened. All right. And that's the best that you're here. All right. So which document specifies specific products, like Glorious McAfee AV, which is different than real McAfee? That's a standard, the standard product we use. All right. So uh, access control. Um, so these are the basic access control types. There are preventive controls that stop a bad thing from happening. There are detective controls that don't stop anything. They just detect that it has happened, like a camera. There are corrective controls that try to undo the harm, and recovery controls that are similar 
deterrent controls try to scare away the attacker but don't really prevent them. This is like a sign that says uh, dangerous dog but there is no dog. That's a deterrent. And there's compensating controls that try to overcome, that try to correct for the weakness in another control. So there's the uh, description. The corrective controls correct a damage system or process like some antivirus will actually remove the file. Most of it will, and that, that is a corrective control. After the file has penetrated your preventive defenses and gotten in, you detect and remove it, so that corrects the problem. And recovery controls restore functionality after an incident, like backups, how you get back to normal. Uh, deterrent controls scare people away. And compensating controls try to compensate for weaknesses in other controls, so you have server log reviews to detect the things that got through your preventive controls. And that's what the network security monitoring class was about last semester. Your preventive controls will never be 100% effective, so you have to have behind them another layer of compensating controls of review to detect what got through and then cope with it. In addition to those six categories, there are three other categories that apply to each of the six categories for a grand total of 18 if you want to be like that. There's administrative controls, which are regulations. The boss says it and there will be some kind of administrative punishment. Um, then there are technical controls, which is software or hardware enforcing something. And then there are physical controls, uh, like locks and security guards and gates and fences to stop where people physically go. Those are the three general categories that apply to all the others. You can have preventive and corrective and deterrent controls in all these types. So here's some preventive controls in the physical world, blocks in the technical world, firewalls block certain traffic from going through, and administrative controls. You have drug screening so people with that are on drugs cannot get hired and that prevents them from getting in the company. You have detective controls here where you detect things and um, then you have deterrent controls where you just try to scare people away. Warning banners before you log in and a policy that threatens you for punishment but it's likely that you'll get away with it. So this may scare some people into not doing the bad thing. Um, all right, then there's risk analysis. Uh, the point here is to try the Goal of risk analysis is to make scientific, calculated decisions about how to spend your security money to benefit the company. So you, instead of just re watching the headlines and seeing a threat, oh, there are terrorists blowing things up, we better do something about that, you take the threats and you consider your assets, what you're trying to protect, and you figure out how vulnerable you are, and you rate which threats are actually likely to do us harm, and then you consider how much would it cost to prevent those threats, and then you figure out which expenses are justified and which expenses are not justified. If you don't do risk analysis, you waste your money on ineffective activities that do not actually protect your assets in the most effective way. So the game is threat times vulnerability, um, the earthquake risk is the same in Boston and San Francisco because in San Francisco we have a high chance of earthquakes, but we have high building codes so the buildings can actually tolerate earthquakes. In Boston, they have very few earthquakes, but the buildings are built very poorly, so they're more likely to fall down. So the total amount of expected damage per year from earthquakes is about the same. That's their argument here. I don't know if that's mathematically true, but that's the point. Um, so impact is the amount of damage, that times vulnerability times impact. Uh, if you want to look at it that way, um, it's probably not often the case that you have estimates that are accurate enough to actually multiply numbers here, but that shows the positive correlation. Um, and human life is generally considered a near infinite impact. All, very few of us are actually willing to write off human life as an acceptable loss, except of course for the military. And for that matter, doctors, people with vaccines and stuff, are also willing to accept a certain amount of death as an acceptable loss, although it is traditional to try to uh, not admit that in public. But you must. Anyway, so you have, um, typically you cannot boil this down to real dollars and numbers and you settle for like high, medium, and low. And then you say how likely is it, how serious are the consequences. And so things that cause, that are not likely to happen and cause very little damage, you just, that's a low risk, you don't have to do anything about it, you can just accept that risk. Things that are likely and catastrophic are the things that you ought to be spending your money preventing. What does the E stand for? Uh, extreme. extreme. It's low, medium, extreme, something like that. Extreme risk. Oh, medium, yeah. High and extreme. Yeah. yeah. Low, medium, high, and extreme, something like that. Yeah. So uh, when you can get everything down to numbers, you put the asset value in dollars. The exposure factor is the amount of the asset that will be damaged by the the uh, threat, and that's your single loss expectancy. So if you think an earthquake will damage your building, but it won't completely <coughs> destroy it, it's only going to 
half damage your building, then your exposure fact, your single loss expectancy is half the value of the building. Then you figure out how often that will happen per year. And now you can figure out how many dollars per year you're going to lose from this threat. And now you can decide how many dollars per year you want to spend to prevent it. Obviously, you want to spend less dollars than you would have lost, or it's better to just not protect yourself and let it happen. So the total cost of ownership of a mitigating safeguard, you have the upfront cost, the cost of maintenance, the staff, the training, all the things that go together. And that's how much you really pay for some kind of safeguard. Now, this is where Microsoft often says, Windows is cheaper than Linux. Linux might be free, but it's more expensive to train your staff, more expensive to update the systems, more expensive for people to get their work done because the software they're using is crappy junk like OpenOffice that doesn't really have all the features you need. And if you actually add up the total cost of what it's costing you, you'd be better to just pay for Windows and then have standard people that just took a standard certification class that would actually be able to do the job and all that jazz. Yeah. What was that country in Europe that they went to Linux and they said it cost too much so went back to... Yeah, Switzerland and Germany did that. They Germany went, went I think to Germany went to open office and after a few years they said, this sucks, they went back to Microsoft. Because <laughs> they sometimes, their argument is not entirely stupid. But if you just use the standard product, it'd be worth paying our price. Yeah. So the return on investment <laughs> is in general, whenever you send money on something, <laughs> you calculate um, how much you pay for it and how much you expect to get, and you have a positive ROI on a security control if the amount you pay for the control <laughs> is less than the amount of money you would have lost by not paying for the control. This is why it's pretty harsh when something happens like just happened this week where Equifax, one of the biggest breaches in history, the Bush administration decided to just not do anything about it. So apparently they're going to just get away with it, and therefore all their security staff saying, you should hire more staff, buy better fire. They'll say, oh, how about we just fire all of you and just let us get hacked since it doesn't seem to cost us anything to get hacked. Isn't that great? Uh, yeah. So how would that translate into a situation where I buy some capital equipment and they say, at what point in time, four years or sometime in the future, will I reach my ROI point? How does that Yeah, well, that's the issue. I mean, if you buy something like a machine to manufacture something, then as time passes, it starts breaking and it takes more and more money to update it, to upgrade it, and the new one is better, so you're less and less efficient compared to what you could be. So there comes a time when continuing to use the old one is more expensive than replacing it with a new one. That's all. All right, so, um, all right. so here's your choices. You can just not do anything and accept the risk. This is what people do who don't plan, but it, if you plan, you decide which risks to take. Like your employees might make unauthorized copies on the copy machine and steal the pencils, and probably any attempt to prevent that would just be a waste of time, so forget it. Just buy a few more pencils and keep going. Um, or you can try to mitigate it, or you can try to transfer it to somebody else by buying insurance, or you can try to avoid the risk by just no longer engaging in that activity. This is what risk avoidance is the most irritating people. There will be no cell phones in class. There will be no playing games, no social networks, no none of this, none of that. That's risk avoidance. We'll just not do those things. Uh, this is the stupidest knee-jerk reaction of an authoritarian uh, people. They call these guys Dr. No in the security world. And what happens is everybody just ignores them and does it anyway. So you end up worse off than if you actually made some reasonable rule, <laughs> generally. So quantitative analysis is where you actually boil it down to dollars. That would be nice, but usually you have to make guesses and estimates. So all you really get is qualitative numbers like high, medium, and low for these risks. Um, there are many different systems. Here's the NIST technique. You identify your systems, then your threats, then your vulnerabilities. Now you consider your controls and determine your risks and decide what controls to implement. They're all doing essentially the same thing in various frameworks. Um, so then you might consider your types of attackers. This is threat analysis. Some people are really into this stuff where you try to decide who is going to attack you. Um, you got the black hat hackers that are trying to steal credit card numbers and make money, and the white hat hackers that are trying to obey the law, and the gray hat hackers that are the ones in the middle. You got the script kiddies that don't know much, but they might be numerous, like anonymous. They might flood you with some lame attack that brings down your servers. You got the people outside your company and the people inside. The insiders are certainly more dangerous because they actually have valid logins and access to the building and everything, but you would like to imagine you have some degree of control over them. So. Uh, <coughs> You got the people that hack for political reasons and various other. There's lots of different kinds of attackers. So one way to go is rather than uh, than focusing on your assets and protecting them, you could focus on what are who's going to attack us anyway? Who hates us? And let's figure out how to do something about those people that hate us. Um, so there are just different ways to get there, and uh, there's no clear reason one is better than another. So a warning sign. What's that?
Okay, that's a deterrent. All right. An electric fence. Most people, I'd say prevent it, but yeah. <laughs> All right. But by the way, you can always make a stretch argument for each one. You have to pick sort of the best of fuzzy categories, which is definitely in the spirit of the CISSP. <laughs> okay. All right. A security camera. What's that? That one's pretty clearly considered in one category. Oh, that's true. It's also in one of these categories. I was thinking of a different set of categories. All right. That's technical. Um, by the way, you could overthink it. You can always overthink these until you get sick. Like you could say, if it was automatically detecting emotion, that would be technical. But if it was about a human watching it, it would be administrative. You know, you can, you can go mad. And that's true of all the CISSP stuff. That's why you really need to practice test. Because at a certain level of deep thought, it all just turns into chaos. You have to, you have to learn to think like Dilbert's boss. Anyway, so, so an acceptable use policy. What's that? OK, that is administrative. Okay, and if you have high likelihood and low impact, what should you do? That's just accepted. All right, you have 100 cars worth 50K each and employees wreck 1% of them per year. So what is the annualized lost expectancy? All right, it's 50K, you have 100 cars, 1% of them are gonna be wrecked every year, that's one car at 50K. So on average, we're gonna lose 50k per year from Rex, so now we can consider doing stuff like putting uh, speed limiters in the cars or something to lower the number of Rex. We can compare the price of that to the price of this many cars and decide whether it's worth having. All right, as long as we don't count human life as important, which would complicate things. So uh, mu times two, hua, Josh, and DJS. So I know who DJS is, and I know who Anna is, and I think I know who E is. And Joshua, I think I know who that is, yeah. But I don't know Mu or MSCH or Hua. So you'll have to tell me who you are to get your points. And that's the end of the chapter. Um, so now I just want to talk about groups. Uh, some people are already in a group, and they already did a project last week, and they might have done something this week. And if you have, I'm going to count that as extra credit. Next week is when I'm going to no longer call them extra credit. Task three is going to be the first one where it's required. And so you, by the end of today, you should be in a group or know what you're supposed to do for next week. So we have at least one more group member here, group leader here. And if there anybody else wants to speak up and be a leader, that's fine. But with you, we have three groups I know of. Two people focused just on passing the test where your homework is like do a problem out of the book or something, which is fine. And him, who has actually hands-on projects. So talk about it. Well, I, I think we mentioned it last yeah, week yeah. at the thing. And, um, so we're going to be building up the servers and then breaking it up into different software components of that. So we'll have a firewall team, a Windows team, and a ESXi uh, VMware team. Um, you know, and we can cross train and stuff as well. So yeah, we got rack mounted servers in 2.14, and that's what it's going to be wiring up, configuring the software, and getting some server stuff going. I mean, running as a group outside of the class, too. So we'll have a couple extra hands and just whoever uh, comes on here. I was I got a bunch of emails from, from people last week and was going to get together uh, a mailing list. Uh, it still has been coming together. So, so the important thing is good. every week you need to know what your job is and you're, you need to communicate with your leader and find a, And he has to be able to tell me whether you actually did it next week. So that has to happen. If that doesn't happen, then the leader has failed. So is there anybody who's not in a group? All right, a bunch of people are not in a group. So you either have to step up and form a group. You want to be a leader? Yeah. Oh, good. Come up here and tell us your story. Both of you come up here. There's people that want groups. Up in then. Great, you want to project uh, something? No, it's from notes. Um, okay, good. All right, let's hear it. Uh, so my idea for a group is actually to network with other InfoSec professionals in the city. I mean, this is like it's tech capital. Okay. Capital. There's a bunch of meetups, a bunch of talks. Um, so my idea is actually plan out like weekly meetups. You can go to meetup. Um, if you can't go to meetup, you can watch like DEF CON, Black Hat, all those videos online. Write like a summary about it. Yeah. So yeah, that's pretty much it. That's pretty simple. That's a good idea. I never thought of that, but that sounds good. Yeah. How will you measure the progress? Uh, so like tasks would be like for a week, you, you can go to like an actual meetup and just show me a picture of like a like a badge or something like that. Um, if you can't make it to a meetup or an event, you can just watch a video online and 
send me like a 200 word you know, essay about, hey, what's the thing is about? So um, I noted that at the end, near the end of like the course, um, it's around the same time as RSA, B-sides. So that could be like something you can work towards. You, know, you can go to these events, which are kind of big security conferences, and know a little bit about uh, the industry beforehand. So I had a lot of fun going to these things. Uh, it's pretty cool. So. That's a very good idea. Um, I know Alan keeps mentioning that RSA has a student day this year. RSA week. does have a yeah. student day. In fact, let me mention, I've got this stuff on my website. If you go here, um, there is a student day and there's a registration for student day. So it's down here someplace, yeah. If you register, uh, here's RSA, and before that comes the day you have to, here, register, by April 1, you can register for college day, then you can go one day for free. So that's cool. Check that out if you want to. Um, yeah, this is great. So you should talk to him. Make sure he has your name. And uh, there's another person you want to lead your group. Come tell us what you've got. And what's your name, by the way? My name's Nelson. Nelson. Okay, good. So, so let me make a note. We got Nelson okay, with um, meetups. Can we sit here? And we got Dylan. 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 With the server stuff. And we have runs like a you. What's your name? Joseph. Joseph. Good. Okay. You might invite to borrow this. Go ahead. All right. All right, let's see if this goes. You might have to plug in the other one on the right. There's two feeds. Let me move this out of here. All right. Plug in this. Right. When you plug in both of those, you may actually be able to project something. And then again, you might just get hosed. We'll see. Yeah, it looks like You don't have one of those? I don't have an HDMI port. Oh, OK. That's fine. All right, come on. All right, so in short, my group is just pretty much called Just Cuz. I honestly don't want to do forensic exams all day. I have other things I have to do as well. So my group would just be offering flexibility. We could go over a few topics, such as security outline, or sorry, um, security research, pick a topic, write it maybe about a page or so about it. And then we could go through CTFs. And then, where were the other ones? Practice exams. Even though I'm not planning to take the exam, it's good to go through them anyway, because eventually, if you do plan to, something to at least have something in your pocket already. So going into the kind of the details for the security research, as I mentioned, depending on how many people are in the group, you'll just go in a group, pick a topic, research it, whatnot, report back to me via email, Excel sheet, something that shows that you've done something for the work. And then for the CTFs, again, depending on how many people are in the group, each one could take on maybe, let's say there's 100 questions, first group could take 10, kind of go through them, work them on, and any difficulties, we could bring them on as a group at the end of the week. And the way that could be, again, the outline for it, we could do it all one topic a week. Let's say week one, we do one chapter of process exams, next week we do a CTF together. So pretty much it just offers flexibility to anyone who's either unable to do anything outside of work, class, don't want to take practice exams, stuff of the sort. So pretty straightforward. Again, anything else that comes to group that comes to mind as a group, you can go that route as well. So let me put this back up there. I want to um, I want to say a couple more things so everyone knows what's happening. One issue is one. There's only a couple requirements I'm going to place on you guys, and the first thing is you have to do something every week. And the second thing, and your manager has to be able to tell that you've done it. And the second thing is we have to support remote people, which is what I remember. There's people on Zoom and people watching these streams, and they need to be able to participate. So you have to have some way to do that. You should be able to communicate by email or Zoom or something. So for that, in that regard, let's have some contact information for people who are not physically here. So Dylan, you should have an email or something up here, and Joseph, and uh, uh, Nelson. So just come up here and type in like an email address or something so we get it on the screen and on the video and everything. So the people that are not physically here can contact you. Yeah. How about the other two groups, uh, the leaders? Are yeah, do you guys still want more people or do you have enough? You were, you were one of the leaders. I got enough. You got enough, that's what I thought. There's another group, is that person here the leader of the other group? No. Well, that's not good, so he may have flaked on us. <laughs> that's okay. yeah. So my question is, do you actually want to join a group that is doing the uh, the, the actual tests? Yeah, well, there isn't one now. So, so you still, can lead one, but there is not one available to join now. It's still mine. There won't be much writing. It's 
more physical. And she wants to practice for the test. He doesn't want to add any more people. He had like 10 people anyway. That's fine. I certainly don't want to force anybody to take too many people. Right, but there's two groups, right? Yeah, the other guy, I don't know. Maybe he's on the... Wait, so if <laughs> Let's see if I have any chat messages. If the leader of the other group is online, speak up. I have a chat. Let's see what the chats have to say. Okay, Jeffrey, I'm looking for teammates to take practice exams. There you go. Okay, so Jeffrey is apparently the leader of the other group. That's good. So let me put him on my list here. So Jeffrey, um, which is uh, practice exams, and he's given me some information, which is CCSF VM Ghost. Okay, CCSF VM Ghost at Outlook.com. Let's see if I got that right. CCSF. Yeah. I hear a voice, but they do not answer. Perhaps my on mute. Let me see. I'm not on mute. Yeah, what's up? Nope, I'm hearing a voice, but not any back and forth. Anyway, so Jeffrey, CCSF VM Ghost at Outlook.com. Okay, so those are the four groups that are taking members. So before you leave, you should be in one of these groups. If you come here next week and you say I didn't find a group, you're going to start losing points. Um, and your group members, the group leaders, make sure everybody should know what they're supposed to do this week. And we have plenty of time. You can meet and talk and decide something. I know a couple of people like Joseph wasn't quite clear what he wanted to do. You can have a discussion and decide what to do. But every week, you need to have something you're going to do in the way of homework. And that would be some way to tell if you did it. That's all I care about, as long as it's something in the area of security. All these are fine. The meetups I'd never thought of before, but that's perfectly fine. Yeah? So, tasks. Uh, when you say task one, two, and three, right. so what are One and two are actually, the task is up to your group, but it should be something, like do two, three CTF problems, or go to one meetup or something, or do some practice stuff, practice exam problems. But do we have to turn in anything, because you were saying like... Only to your group leader. Okay. And all you have to do is, uh, is convince your group leader that you did your task, mm -hmm. and then they will report to me that you did. Okay. That's the plan. Yeah. yeah. Else. Uh, another question. There is too much of a delay. Be in yeah. my group. Uh, I mean, yeah, Jeffrey, that's yeah. fine. Um, yeah. Oh, Jeff, too much to talk. Yeah. So, Jeffrey, I put you here so people can contact you. I understand there's a minute delay, so uh, verbal conversation doesn't work well here, which is fine. But he's a leader. This is good, and he's taking more people. So, if you want practice exams, there's a group available to you. And uh, so that's all I have. But don't leave without being in a group, and then come next week and tell me that this wasn't clear to you. So. That's all. And if you need help, let me know. But uh, this is by, not just that I'm a lazy bum, but this is intended to create some management in the class. Uh, you should have some people willing to step up and take responsibility for others, and there may be some arguments out of it, and my intention is that you should live through that here in a relatively safe environment. Because this is supposed to be about management. So, any other questions or anything? There yeah. was another group just concentrating on CTFs. That was the only two. There was Jeffrey was uh, one. There was another one. Oh, there was another one. But I haven't seen the guy. And yeah, I if the manager him. hasn't reappeared, I would assume they vanished. That is the hard part about this college. Half the students just vanish out of every class as the semester goes yeah. by, including group leaders. So we all have to cope with that. So by the way, if you are, let me let me interrupt you guys for a minute. If you are a group leader. It's a good idea to appoint a lieutenant. So if you don't make it to class, there's somebody else to represent you. That's perfectly fine. But if you just don't show up, then you're not going to get your points. So, and it will kind of foul up the rest of your team, too. So be aware of that. <laughs> but be aware that a lot of people are going to flake out as the semester goes on. That's just the nature of this college. Well, the Nelson's yeah. was... He added CTFs in his thing, too. He added yes. A variety. Yeah. Nelson was considering a variety of things, yeah. yeah. So, so the only Dylan was going to do servers. Nelson. These two guys, uh, one of them was going to do meetups. Yeah. That was Nelson, right? Yeah. 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 And he Joseph was, was going to do CTFs and stuff. Nelson was going to do meetups. Yeah. And he also used to talk about CTFs and stuff towards the yeah. end. Yeah, yeah. But this, this guy was mainly talking about meetups. <laughs> Let's make the options as clear as possible. Dylan was going to make servers. Now, and Joseph was going to do various things. It's more so we need some physical stuff, but we also need some policy stuff, uh, user yep. creation, that kind of thing. So it, it, does, it spans more than just the physical aspects. All right. Well, that's the plan. I'm going to save this document so I know who's supposed to be the managers next time. And uh, the managers have the responsibility to communicate with the team and tell me every week whether people did their work or not. And if anybody feels abused or mismanaged, let me know and I will try to cope. <clears throat>
And we already have one manager that has gone AWOL. So it can certainly happen that your manager flakes out. And if it does, I will try to cope. OK, so don't leave without joining one of these groups. So talk to these people. They are here if you need a group. If you're in my group, I've got an issue, so I'll Yeah, good. All right, he's got a group already. He's not adding new members, but you already have a pile of members, so a bunch of people are on your team. And I know you actually had some results last week. Yes. If you have results this week, just email them in or something. Yes. Good. Okay, good. Good. A professionally run group. You're going to be a good CISSP. I can tell already. <laughs> okay.